Let's get the mic. All right, there we go. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good, good afternoon, Bitcoiners. You're here at the Changing Demand for Ordinals. I don't know who wrote this, uh, this topic name, but we're going to make this super interesting. I will touch on a little bit about the changing demand, but I really want to talk about what all of us are super excited for about the future and what's going to drive demand in the future uh, for ordinals. So my name is Trevor Owens. I'm the managing partner of the Bitcoin Frontier Fund. We're an early stage uh, venture capital fund investing in uh, many of the companies here. I'm actually an investor in two of the, of the four individuals up here, hopefully the other two uh, in the near future. And um, you know, we write very uh, small investments in many different companies, about 100K check on average. We have a portfolio of 50 companies building on Bitcoin. And I'm super excited to kick off today's discussion. So I want to actually give the panelists an uh, opportunity to introduce themselves very briefly. So we'll start with Bruff, and we'll go uh, from here, from your right to the left here. Uh, so Bruff, kicking off, uh, who are you and what do you do? Awesome. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Brian Lachlan. I go by Bruffstar on the interwebs. Uh, I'm the co-founder of Ordinals Bot. So we essentially created a uh, the first inscription service on ordinals, making it really easy for people to inscribe data on Bitcoin. So at the time in February, basically, you had to just uh, have your own node, and a Bitcoin node and uh, ordinals client, and we basically put a front end on that, essentially, where you can just drag and drop files. So it's been an absolute roller coaster of the last eight months. Uh, everyone's excited about ordinals and uh, really looking forward to talking today about them. That's good. Pass your mic. Pass your mic. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Ken. I'm the founder of Xverse. So Xverse is a Bitcoin Web3 wallet. Uh, what that means is we support things like ordinals, NFTs, uh, DeFi on top of Bitcoin. Um, and you can connect your Xverse wallet to all kinds of applications. I believe right now we are basically the most widely integrated uh, Bitcoin wallet, uh, you know, period. And uh, yeah. We are on mobile as well as desktop as a Chrome extension. So uh, you can go ahead and try to download, download it and try it. Hi, I'm Danny Yang. I'm the founder of a company called Medigood and creator of an uh, ordinal collection called Onchain Monkey and also uh, Oshura, the, the marketplace for, for ordinals. And my, my back, I got into Bitcoin because I, I was originally a, a Bitcoin maxi. I still am. The, I started one of the early Bitcoin exchanges that's still around today called MyCoin. It's the largest in Taiwan. And I'm really um, excited to see the building of or builders getting back to Bitcoin because of Ordinals. Hey, um, I'm Raf. Um, I'm at the moment the lead maintainer of the Ordinals protocol. I got into this. Um, I found this Casey guy. He's the creator of Ordinals more than a year ago now. Um, and I just started contributing to the repo when it was just us two. Um, and yeah, it blew up, and now it's this huge protocol with all these cool companies building on top. And yeah, very excited to be here and talk about what we're up to. Awesome. All right, so now I want to ask you guys, uh, why do this? Why do ordinals on Bitcoin? Why bring monkey JPEGs uh, you know, from Ethereum? Danny, actually, you're spending a million dollars to bring your monkey JPEGs uh, to Bitcoin. Um, sorry, guys. I'd love to start with Bruff. We'll go uh, from, from left to right here again. But why do this on Bitcoin? What unique advantages do ordinals on Bitcoin have as opposed to NFTs on Ethereum? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I launched actually an NFT collection on Ethereum. So I've got like kind of a taste of both worlds. And, you know, at the time, it's smart contract based. You know, you have to learn how to do that, first of all. So that's a barrier. Um, and then obviously you need to find out where you're hosting the images essentially, you know, uh, that, so the difference, the clear difference to me when I looked into ordinals and realized actually these things are on chain and you're inscribing them directly on, on the Bitcoin blockchain, that just really opened up my mind and, and, and solved that issue that everyone seems to be holding against the Ethereum NFTs where it's, they're either hosted on IPFS or somewhere more centralized. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin just, uh, sorry, Ordinals just basically cuts through that and you're inscribing the data directly on chain. And I think that the way that the Ordinals protocol also was created was just really beautiful because it's just really easy to inscribe onto. There's, you, you essentially just inscribe, on, uh, inscribe anything and it gets added to the index. So it's a very easy thing to wrap your head around to, in terms of just inscribing stuff, whether it's a single image or any kind of file or a whole collection. Uh, you know, you can just do that directly on chain. And I think Bitcoin just comes with this extra gravitas and everyone just knows Bitcoin. So the fact that you're launching stuff on that chain 
just gives it an extra kind of a feeling of okay, it's really it's Bitcoin, you know. So. And so, how, like, how much, how much time and how much resources did it take to launch an Ethereum NFT project versus how many resources does it take to launch a Ordinals project? Well, in 2021, when I launched mine, it was difficult for me because there was no tooling or anything really. You had to learn, I had to learn smart contract development, Solidity. Um, I had to learn about how to launch the ERC721 kind of protocol and everything. So there was a learning curve for me. Um, and then versus on, 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 on Bitcoin with Ordinals, essentially, um, you, you, you run your Bitcoin node and you run the uh, Ordinals client, which is a little bit of a technical hurdle for some people. But at the same time, once you've got it set up, you can just inscribe straight away. Um, and that, that technical part is where we kind of focused on with Ordinals bot and just kind of we wanted to make it we really are advocates of people running their own Bitcoin node, but at the same time, we wanted to try and onboard as many people as we could into the ecosystem. So by just having like a drag and drop interface where people can drag and drop files, literally, and then we handle the inscription in the back end, I think we were able to onboard quite a few people. Awesome. Ken, what about you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so first and foremost, you know, we chose to build on, you know, with Ordinals because we as a wallet, we've been building on Bitcoin for many years. And when we saw Ordinals, it really, it really showed that there were people being excited about this and we could use it to drive adoption. I think that was the most important thing for us. And also, there were a few really unique properties of Ordinals that were um, really interesting to us. So one is that it's basically permanent. Um, when you inscribe something onto the chain, it's, it's going to live there forever, essentially. And you don't need to pay like a third party um, service to store that online for you. Uh, you're basically paying that fee upfront when you make that transaction, right? Compared to Ethereum NFTs where basically the content has to be stored somewhere else, right? And the chain will point to that content. And at some point, those servers hosting that content is going to go down the person paying for that is going to stop paying for it, and then what happens? Your content, your NFT disappears, right? And with Ordinals, there, there isn't such a problem, right? Um, and then the second property is that it's simpler to a certain degree compared to Ethereum M NFTs because you don't need to have a smart contract. Making an inscription is very easy, especially if you have... Um, you know, a tool that lets you do that. For example, Ordinals bot, uh, Xverse now has a uh, inscription service as well that lets you do that. Um, yeah, and, and then just like making things uh, a lot easier. But it also kind of introduces uh, other like difficulties because uh, compared to Ethereum, with Bitcoin, it's not an account-based system, but it's a UTXO-based system. So you have to, you know, present these things these ordinals as kind of like NFT-like assets uh, instead of telling people, hey, this is a UTXO uh, and your ordinals is one of those sats in this UTXO because most people don't understand UTXOs and they don't want to understand UTXOs and they shouldn't, right? So, yeah. Awesome. And Ken, do you think that we can bring, you know, more builders to Bitcoin thanks to ordinals? Do you think that we can up the level of user experience on Bitcoin? Thanks to Ordinals. What, is your thought, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we can definitely, you know, make a better user experience with Ordinals. And in my experience, I've already seen a lot of developers who, uh, you know, were initially, you know, curious about Bitcoin, and then they saw Ethereum and the lack of, you know, tools and support in the Bitcoin ecosystem, and they go to build on Ethereum. But now when they see Ordinals and everything that's being built on Bitcoin, they're coming back to Bitcoin, and that's ultimately a good thing for Bitcoin. Awesome. All right, Danny, so uh, you're investing a million dollars to bring on-chain monkey to ordinals. Absolutely. So, well, first of all, NFTs are actually powerful tools, and they're powerful both on Ethereum and on Bitcoin and on other chains like Solana. And we've seen actually that happen over the last couple of years, particularly starting with Ethereum and then Solana. And now we're seeing it on Bitcoin. Uh, but there's, there's an important difference, though. Ordinals is a protocol for digital artifacts, right? Well, Ethereum and, Ethereum and ERC721, that, that's a protocol for digital certificates. So that's actually a big distinction or, or difference between the two. So, and and I, I know this from personal experience very well because 
my goal when I started on Chain Monkey back in 2021 was to create digital artifacts. And the difference is that uh, the digital artifact is the complete thing. It's like it's like the sculpture. It, you know, you, you you have the marble, you have the thing. Versus the digital certificate is that certificate of ownership that you own the sculpture, right? And they both serve a, a purpose. They're, they're both tools that are you know great to actually use NFTs and crypto for. But on Ethereum, it's a digital you know certificate uh, by design. ERC721, the NFT standard on. Ethereum has a, it has a token URI. That's, that's that pointer or that certificate of the NFT. It's a unique ID for every NFT. And we, because we wanted to do digital artifacts back before Ornos existed, we actually used that token URI to create the actual digital artifacts. So Onchain Monkey actually was a digital artifact on Ethereum back in 2021, um, you know, using a protocol designed for certificates to do an artifact, which is okay. It's like hacking an existing system to work the way you want it to. But now you have a protocol that's you know, designed for digital artifacts. So it made perfect sense for us to move over. And there are actually many advantages to you know, this protocol if you're doing digital artifacts, right? Um, and it, it, that, that is kind of the, the, kind of the beauty of doing this on Bitcoin. Um, you, know, you inherit all these properties that, that they were mentioning. For digital artifacts, I think um, there, there are five main, five main properties, right? Complete, ownable, um, uncensorable, permissionless, and immutable. And the, the complete part is actually the, the, the key thing for the jar of fat in that you're not pointing to something else. Well, you know, the other properties are also great properties of Bitcoin. Actually, all five together are very powerful. And that's why you know, we are kind of investing our resources, you know, time and, and money to actually create you know, these digital artifacts uh, on Bitcoin. Awesome. And one more question, Danny, because I know you guys are famously working with Aspi Bugatti, which is an amazing 200-year-old brand, I think. Um, and they're launching their first uh, NFT project on Ordinals. Why did they choose Bitcoin uh, uh, over Ethereum? Yeah, so back, I believe it was in February, um, we, we heard that they were thinking of, of doing a, basically an NFT, right? So this is Asprey Studios and Bugatti, the, the, the car you know, company known for their very you know, high-end luxury cars. Uh, and you know, we, we pitched them, well, you know, there's this new thing called, you know, Bitcoin Ornos, or rather there's this thing called Bitcoin that you could put digital artifacts on. It's actually, you know, something that has these great properties. And they were, um, they, they were very open, and then they were pretty sold after we, you know, talked to them a few times about it. And so we actually, you know, helped them create the, the Asprey Bugatti uh, A collection. So it's a digital artifact on Bitcoin. Uh, one of their, uh, basically, you know, they, they care about kind of high end, right? Everything they do is high end. And I think an earlier panel discussed this too, where you know, Bitcoin can be basically the, if, so let's say, let's put it this way. If you have something that's worth a million dollars or more, like where would you want to secure that, right? You probably want to secure it on the most secure blockchain. So it kind of makes sense to go to Bitcoin to do this. So, so yeah, I mean, they're, they're launching their collection or it just launched, you can see them, you know, on Bitcoin already. So, you know, I think just selling on basically the project is Bitcoin and you have, Ornos are Bitcoin, but it's a, you could say it's a way to interpret Bitcoin to actually see these digital assets or these digital artifacts. Um, and, and that's kind of the beauty of this protocol, which actually Raf can talk about there because you know, he's part of the lead maintainers. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, Raf, so you're one of the masterminds behind the Ornals protocol, now the lead maintainer. So from a development perspective, how do you view Ornals being different than everything else um, on all the other blockchains? And how do you view that vision continuing in the future? Yeah, I mean, the guys made great points here, so I just like to summarize. Basically, like, if somebody asks you what are inscriptions, inscriptions are Bitcoin native, immutable, on-chain digital artifacts. And Ordinals is basically the vessel to transfer these uh, artifacts from one person to another. Um, and what makes this very nice from a development perspective is that everything is on-chain. So uh, when you, like, you design your backend and you have like, these NFTs on Ethereum, you have to like, pull data from all these different sources, whereas on Bitcoin, uh, or with ordinals or inscriptions, you just look at Bitcoin and pull all your data from the Bitcoin chain. So it makes it very easy to kind of manage it from, from a development perspective. Um, and that's kind of the, the kind of unique, uh, unique thing uh, about yeah, digital artifacts on, on, on Bitcoin. And also, with art, you always want to kind of attach yourself to something that has a good story, has good lore. And Bitcoin is kind of the best from all the cryptocurrencies there is. It's the oldest, the most decentralized. It has the best story. 
And especially for, for artists, uh, it's very nice to kind of attach to that kind of broader context. Um, yeah, and I hope more and more people realize this and come to, come to Ordnance and inscriptions and uh, build cool stuff. It's the Bugatti of blockchains. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. So yeah, Ordnance on, on Bitcoin. Awesome. And so, I mean, Raf, the uh, not having any reliance on smart contracts, right? Ordinals don't require smart contracts. That makes everything much more simple or mm -hmm. simpler than, than doing things on Ethereum. But what about like programmability? Because that's the trade off that you make. But interestingly, there are programmable aspects that you're adding to the protocol, such as recursive endpoints. Could you uh, touch on that a little bit? So yeah, recursive endpoints is kind of this nice thing that we can enable because the data is on chain. Uh, recursive endpoints is a little bit of a misnomer, but what it basically lets us do is access the data of other inscriptions and data that is also native to Bitcoin. So um, the most used case for this is accessing the data of other inscriptions. So you can inscribe, for example, generative art. You have these, uh, most of the time, JavaScript libraries that generate some shapes and colors. So you inscribe the JavaScript library as an inscription. And then you reference this JavaScript library from another inscription, and maybe you reference some other part from it, and then you kind of build it all together into one inscription, and it creates this beautiful piece of art. And you're referencing all the data that is on chain and kind of bringing it together, kind of like a collage. Um, so it makes these inscriptions kind of composable. Um, and then there's also other kinds of endpoints. Um, we call them recursive endpoints, where, for example, you can access uh, the block hash of the current block. And this gives you a very, like, a sort of random value. It's not very high entropy, but you can kind of take this as a seed for your, for your art, as your, for your generative program, and then it does something different depending on what the block height is. So it's kind of this dynamic art that changes every time there's a new block. Um, and yeah, we have also a couple other ones where you can kind of just get the block height. So I don't know, maybe you uh, have this inscription that builds like a tower and every new block, you have a new block on top uh, that is generated. Like there's a bunch of fun stuff you can do. At the moment we have only like four endpoints, but we really want to add more so that people can uh, yeah, really build cool stuff uh, with like in and around Bitcoin. Like the, the base philosophy of these, these endpoints is that anything that is on Bitcoin should be accessible to inscriptions. Um, so any kind of data that you can find on chain should be available to inscriptions. And yeah, we're slowly kind of building out these endpoints and uh, trying to make them nice and usable and for, for artists to yeah, build cool art. So would you say that inscriptions are becoming self-aware and they're also becoming more and more aware of Bitcoin's state? Yeah, of course. I mean, that's, that's the goal, like to be uh, very intertwined with Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, this is, it's a digital artifact, it's, it's art, and we want to kind of build art in and around Bitcoin. So this is kind of the, the best way to do it. Um, just promote, like there's one inscription. Um, so everybody probably knows in this room there's these different cycles that Bitcoin has. I mean, the most well-known is the happening. Then there's also the difficulty adjustment. And um, we have these different cycles in Bitcoin. And um, we, or not me, but Casey, created this, this clock that kind of references these different cycles. So one time around the clock would be a happening or one nook would be these, sometimes the halvening and the difficulty adjustment coincide. That's another kind of cycle. Um, and then there's two others that I don't have at the top of my mind right now. But like, that's a very nice like, piece of art that kind of, you look at this and you're like, ha, ah, what is this? And then you are like, ah, oh, okay, the halvening, mm, what's that? Or like, oh, what's the difficulty adjustment? So it's this kind of rabbit hole you can get into for people who look at this art and like, they then, um, yeah, get deeper into Bitcoin, try to understand it on a more, more deeper level. Um, so yeah, that's, that's art, you know? Think about it, discuss it. Um, yeah, I, I, I love it, I love it. All right, so I wanna go to Danny now. So Danny, um, with your recent collection, OnChain Monkey Dimensions, you guys used um, endpoints and recursion to do a lot of interesting and leading edge things. Could you talk about that a little bit and yeah. talk about why that made sense to do on Bitcoin? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Bitcoin, so I'll talk about kind of media of art, but, but first of all, Bitcoin, I would consider Bitcoin actually a wonder of the digital world, right? And you have like seven wonders of the, the ancient world, right? And those are all considered art, basically, right? Like human, um, like, like humans want to express themselves through art, and that's been happening for as long as humans have been around, recorded history and even prehistory. Even Neanderthals used to carve, you know, bone, uh, animal bones, right? That, that, this is for art, right? And these, this gets preserved over time. 
And Bitcoin actually now is also a, and I consider Bitcoin also art, but now with foreign notes, Bitcoin is a medium for art. Uh, you can actually create, so through these recursive endpoints and other uh, ways, you can make art that's native to Bitcoin. And recursive endpoint is actually that particular type of thing that you can do. And so one type of art that works very well with Bitcoin as a medium is actually programmable art. Um, this is beyond, well, well first you can do images, right? People have been doing kind of JPEGs and PNGs and these image files uh, on Bitcoin. But you can also actually write code that generates images or other things. And so that's where recursive inscriptions makes it very powerful, where you can write a piece of code that calls on another piece of code that calls on, so what we did with OCM Dimensions was, well first we wrote a piece of code that's a compression library, or actually it's a decompression library, that we could then use that piece of code to run on basically compressed data, which was a piece of code that was actually the 3.js and p5.js libraries. These are actually libraries for creating a lot of on, uh, or generative art that, that people have. These are actually uh, general libraries for creating like images, 3D, 2D, um, uh, but people have used those over the years to make art, and then we use those on Bitcoin now, all natively on-chain on Bitcoin to create more art. And so OCM Dimensions was basically kind of the, the first art that was created using these libraries because we inscribed them um, to, to do this thing. And then we also you know, published it on GitHub so people, other people, other artists and creators can use them to basically build, you know, Bitcoin art using Ornos. And also this uses very, because we compress and we use code to generate, so this is like generative art, you generate it from the code, uh, it uses very little block space. So it's very efficient use of, of Bitcoin's block space to do actually very, impressive and detailed things. Um, and this is, like, people didn't think this was possible, right? That you could use Bitcoin's limited block space to do actually very cool, you know, human expression of art that can be very lasting and have these nice properties. Yeah, and for OCM Dimensions, I remember you bought like a, what, like a 60 inch uh, 8K monitor or something like that, and you, and you blew up the, the artwork on that monitor and it was like crystal clear. We all know Bitcoin, you, it's only four megabytes per block if you, you know, use the, uh, the segregated witness. So you've kind of showing people that you don't have to be limited by the block size. You can actually make high resolution stuff on, on ordinals, correct? Absolutely, and it, uh, another nice, there's a bunch of nice features of ordinals, the protocol. And one of them is actually that it's basically made to be browser compl uh, compatible. Basically, you know, every web browser, mobile browser, y you can go to ordinals uh, explorer and just load these inscriptions and it, it renders them there. It's not, it's not just rendering the image. Someone mentioned markdowns, but also uh, 3D renderings, you know, virtual world. You could render all these natively, or just straight from basically Bitcoin if you have a Ford uh, or aware client or explorer, which is not the case for other um, NFTs on other chains. Because as I mentioned earlier, you know, a digital certificate protocol, you, you get the certificate, but that doesn't tell you, that doesn't tell your browser uh, how to, how to actually, you know, display it and all that. But in uh, for all those, the the thing is basically this this um it, it just automatically works across basically the, the broadest um, platforms, which is you know your your browser. Yeah, and this is something that actually you can't do on Ethereum today, right? I mean, if you look at uh, Artblocks, for example, which did hundreds of millions of dollars in volume in the previous cycle, um, they don't reference P5JS on chain, do they? And and why is that? So actually, uh, that's kind of a longer conversation, but. Art blocks is actually great, so I'm, I'm not going to flood them. It's actually very great. Inspire a lot of artists to do. You can, you can flood them if you want, Dan. It's okay. <laughs> Inspire a lot of artists to do actually amazing work. So art blocks is a great platform. However, they have to work with basically the ERC721 protocol, which is a digital certificate protocol. So they could not easily do digital artifacts, which is what they also want to do, right? They want to make lasting art that's all on chain, but Ethereum, the protocol doesn't wasn't it didn't exist at the time. So then they had to build a big framework around it. Uh, but the token URI, the thing I mentioned on Ethereum, right, that, uh, the way that Artblocks did it was it pointed to their centralized server. So Artblocks renders it because the digital certificate model of Ethereum doesn't really support what Artblocks want to do. So what Artblocks did to do it, to make it lasting was they, they, um, they took the libraries and all the code and they put them onto Ethereum separately. So they say, well, if you go through this long complicated process, you could theoretically recover the, the art. But no one's going to do that. Just point to our servers, and we'll show you the art, right? So it, it's still 
you know, on chain in their way, but it's not kind of the nice way, right, that Oranos allows you to do. Awesome, it's super exciting. We, we should get art blocks to use inscriptions and ordinals. I don't know if there's someone here or watching. Like, uh, yeah. Oh, we, uh, we've tried to pitch the founder at a party before. Maybe he's, I don't know, he was a little cold at that time, but hopefully he's, he's warming up to it. Um, Ken, what are your thoughts, man, uh, when it comes to, yeah, like, th what is the most innovative thing about ordinals in your mind? You know, is it, is it recursion? You know, is it the user experience? Is it, you know, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, I think with recursive endpoints, one thing that I want to mention is that I think it can go even further than what Danny just mentioned. Uh, it doesn't have to be limited to art or generative art. It can be just like generic programs, right? And I think if you can just treat recursive endpoints as sort of like a, a way to publish little code snippets or even libraries, and you can progressively build on top of that, and at some point you can have like very complex programs that run on Bitcoin uh, that are basically uncensorable, right? Of course, it's not the same as a smart contract. You don't have, you know, on-chain consensus. But if you want to just, just deploy something like a program and reference other people's code, you can do that. Um, and I think that's a really powerful thing. And I hope somebody, you know, goes and actually builds something like that. Yeah, I love that idea. I mean, you could, you could imagine, you know, when it comes to what we've seen over on Ethereum with Tornado Cash, right? Like, the government will go after the front end of the... Uh, of the, the protocol, for example, and they'll shut down that website. Uh, people can still access it from the contract, but now with ordinals potentially, we can put front-end uh, applications on Bitcoin that are then accessible on hundreds of different explorers, which makes it a lot more difficult for the government to then go and censor these different applications. So there's actually a way for Ethereum and Bitcoin to work together, which I think is a little bit exciting. Uh, Bruff, so uh, you've also been working with um, you know, recursion, and you've been doing stuff with HTML Canvas to help people build their art projects. Tell us about that, and, and how does it make things more efficient? How does it make things more exciting? What can you start to do from an art perspective with ordinals through this, through this, this way? Yeah, firstly, I'm so happy you didn't move on from the recursive topic, because I'm like the huge recursive maxi here. I really love the concept of them. You know, we're storing this stuff on Bitcoin, and now recursive inscriptions is basically allowed us to access anything, any of that data there. Um, in particularly, I'm a front-end developer, so, you know, I, I know JavaScript. Um, I think if you're a Rust developer or something like that, you absolutely hate JavaScript, right? We all, that, we all know that. But what JavaScript is, is a really powerful kind of a creative language. You can do a lot of things with it. And if JavaScript's powerful, it means now that ordinals are powerful because you can inscribe HTML inscriptions and you can use the full power of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So the world is limitless. You, you can literally do anything you can do with, with those languages. You can now inscribe entire collections with them. And we've been seeing that over the last few months. People have got really, really creative with it. There's kind of two camps. There's, like the guys mentioned, the generative camps where you're utilizing dynamic libraries and building really creative uh, on-the-fly dynamic art. And then there's also like the collection side. So, um, you know, like we alluded to earlier, some of these NFT collections could be 10,000 pieces in the collection. And that would be really expensive for someone to pay for those JPEGs straight up and on Bitcoin. Um, so with recursion, what you can essentially do is, if your NFT collection is like built up of layers, which most of them are, you've got the individual layers and then you generate the collection and flatten the image. What we've, what we've can, been using with ordinals is you can actually inscribe just the, the layers first. So let's say you've only got 100 layers. You inscribe those 100 layers, and then you can actually then inscribe 10,000 HTML files, um, which essentially builds the layers on the fly uh, and pulls them in recursively. Now, that's a really interesting thing, because then the actual HTML, the, the, the traits themselves could be um, 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, but the HTML file is under one, one kilobyte, you know, um, which is really interesting, especially when you have like a 10K collection or something like that. Um, and then when, when you mentioned about HTML canvas, again, you know, using HTML and using all the, the, the things that come with that, with HTML canvas, what we were able to do was actually kind of layer them inside the HTML canvas. And the beauty of that is when you right click and save, it actually s saves the flattened image, opposed to like saving just the top layer. 
So yeah, I'm really bullish on on, re, uh, on um, recursion. Um, I think it's opening up a lot of possibilities, and like Ken mentioned, it's not just artwork. It could be actual programs as well on Bitcoin. Um, really interesting to see. We've seen also games and loads of other cool things being inscribed. Yeah, it's really exciting. It's awesome. Okay, we're going to talk about rare stats now for a second, and then we're going to. I'm going to. You're going to see, guys. I'm going to tie it all back to the topic of the panel, which is the changing demand for ordinals. Um, I do want to mention quickly an interesting statistic that maybe you guys haven't heard yet, which is that over the past 20 years, 98.4% per of web links from 20 years ago are now broken or no longer exist. And that includes 70% of Harvard Business Journal or Harvard Journal citations and 50% of Supreme Court decision papers. Uh, those links from 20 years ago are dead, right? And so we can all imagine things if, for those of us who are older than 20 years old, I think most of us in this room can remember using the internet and all those different websites that we loved back in the day now kind of being gone, we can imagine the value of a more permanent uh, data store on Bitcoin. While there, all, there are alternatives like IPFS, which actually you need to continue to pay for or the images will uh, come down, or Rweave, which I think is still a... Uh, still in the startup phase, essentially, yet to be proven out. Like, you know, with, with Bitcoin, we, we know Bitcoin's going to be around for many, many years to come. Um, but I want to talk about rare stats, and we're going to tie this back together. So, uh, Bruff, starting with you, how do rare stats potentially drive demand uh, for ordinals or, or for Bitcoin? What do, what do people use them for? How is it, how is it created um, interesting features for you at OrdinalsBot, for example? Um, yeah, I, I really love the rare stats concept. I think that um, Raf can maybe mention. I think that Casey also like basically uh, kind of a, has really created the whole protocol like with that in mind as well with these digital assets in mind. You know, he has also the list of the rare stats. So at the very beginning in February, when I like, kind of dove down the rabbit hole, I really bought into this as well. I thought it's adding an extra layer on top of not only are these things you know special because they're on bitcoin but now we're adding this layer of extra you know uh, value on top because they're they're rare essentially you know um and it's it's really tied into bitcoin and the fact that an uncommon is basically the first sat that's mined in a block so it's really tied to the blockchain and the dynamics and the mechanics of the blockchain which i really love um, and they're rare and they're hard to find. So, you know, yeah, shout out to like companies like Magisat, they call them internet diamonds, and it really is like trying to find diamonds in the rough. Um, and when we launched Ordinals Bot, obviously we take Bitcoin payments. So we've got this inflow of Bitcoin coming in and we essentially put this SAT panner in front of that inflow and we're now been panning and searching for these special SATs and, and we've been ho like hoarding them since February. Um, and then we launched uh, basically the ability to inscribe directly on them. Again, trying to make it really easy for people. So like when you drag and drop that file on, if you want to inscribe it on an uncommon, you don't literally just click the button and then we'll use our stock and we'll inscribe it onto it. So yeah, I think that it adds a really nice layer of collectability and value onto these already kind of cool things. Um, and then not only are uh, like Casey's original um, you know, groups of, of rare sats kind of defined, people have came in now and, and the community has spoken and have gave other uh, you know, groupings. You know, so there's um, pizza sats, for example, which are really interesting. I know Trevor's big in the pizzas. Um, but they're, they're from the famous pizza transaction when the guy spent, was it uh, 10,000 10, Bitcoin on, on, on two pizzas? Um, so now people have been actually sourcing those sats from that actual transaction, um, and we've been sourcing them as well, and you can inscribe onto them. So, yeah, it's, it's a really interesting concept. I think it adds a lot of, a really nice dynamic to the whole ecosystem. Yeah, Raf, go ahead. Yeah, I in. can say something to the rare sats. Um, so when I joined the, 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 the the project in uh, August last year, the rare sats meta had already been created by Casey. So ordinals and inscription is two systems. The base system is ordinals, and this in and inscriptions is like works on top of ordinals. And he had already coded up kind of this sat tracking or this ordinal tracking. And he had also come up with the different rarities. And these different rarities are, as I mentioned before, there's these different cycles in Bitcoin. And basically, there's many common sats. Basically, any sat that's not the first sat of the block uh, or the first sat in the, that, is, uh, that is part of the block subsidy is a, is, a, a com is a common sat. And then the first sat is an uncommon sat. So it's the first kind of rarity. And then there's these different cycles. So then there's a difficulty adjustment every 2048 blocks or 2016 blocks. Um, and that's a rare sat. 
Uh, and then sometimes the difficulty adjustment, oh, and then there's a halvening every four years. I think that's also a class. And then the difficulty adjustment and the halvening, they coincide sometimes. That's also a rare set. So there's, it's a very like exponential curve of like how many rare sets there are. It goes down very, very quickly. Yeah, so the epoch, right? Is yeah, that, exactly. The epoch. I, yeah. I forget the names, the, but like. The, the first one's actually coming up, I think, 2034, maybe? Or is it? Yeah, can, Any, can anyway, yeah, that's yeah, it's gonna like be, in a couple of years. It's still out. So it's, it's still out a couple of years. And, yeah. and that's going to be the first uh, legendary set. Is that correct? I think. Yeah, that could be. Um, and yeah, it's it's a made up system. With like, with, it's like Casey came up with it. I mean, it's also called the Rodemore rarity. Some people are ca calling it that. That's kind of the the rare sets aspect. And then there's the exotic sets, which is just any set that people ascribe meaning to. There's these pizza pizza sets. Um, the new meta is uh, astrologically significant sets. Um, so sats that have been mined when there's, I don't know, an, uh, some, I'm not really deep into astrology, but like some, some moons go across each other, I don't know, like some eclipse, eclipse sats, for example. There's an eclipse coming up. Um, those are like exotic sats that people ascribe meaning to. Uh, so yeah, there, it's, a, it's a fun little thing that you uh, can play with. And now there's a market for these, like especially for the rare sats, there's a market. It's like miners are actually extracting out the first sat. You can see, uh, you can look at the Coinbase transaction and I think over 50% of the hash rate is extracting these uh, rare sats out. So um, it's become a thing, which is pretty funny to see. Um, and yeah, there's a, a bunch of other things you can do with, with the rare sats. Uh, and then, of course, if you want to be, create a really cool inscription, you put it onto a rare sat, like, uh, because it's more difficult to get and adds provenance, adds, adds coolness. Uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Also, there's like significant dates for individuals. like. People yeah. are collecting like their birthday. People are collecting like when they started going out with their girlfriend or when they proposed to their, their fiance or wife. So there's a lot of collectible aspects to this. And Raf, I want to ask you, uh, does this ruin fungibility of Bitcoin? Do rare sats ruin fungibility of Bitcoin? Not really. I mean, if you wish to track sats, you can do it. But the rest of the transactions, they work the same way. Like you can, it doesn't make Bitcoin more or less trackable. Like the, th the thing you can, you can, you could have done it before already. It doesn't really destroy in any sense the privacy. Like of course, if you, um, if you associate yourself with the SAT and you kind of m intermingle it with your like kind of UTXOs that you do not want to um, kind of uh, associate with your, re with your identity, that's of course not good. So you should always kind of keep Ordinal SAT separates from your own SATs, but like on a system level, it doesn't really um, decrease privacy. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, even if you look at the US dollar, right, there's uh, collect, there's like silver dollars that people collect, collect, you know, $2 bills. Like I have a bunch of those from my grandmother. Um, and uh, you, you, the US dollar supply is on the scale of trillions, and then the silver dollars are on the scale of billions. But with rare SATs, specifically, Rotomer rare SATs, um, we're on the scale of what quadrillion for sats? Is it 2.1 quadrillion sats? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it's 21 million times 100 million yeah. per Bitcoin. So, so big it's number. like trillions and billions in the U.S. dollar for these like non-fungible, let's say, silver dollars. And for satoshis, it's like millions of rare sats. Uh, for Rodimer rare and quad, uh, two quadrillion sats. So like the scale of like disruption of fungibility for U.S. dollar is hi is higher from silver dollars than from rare sats. So we're, we're almost running out of time here. I do want to um, give a, a quick anecdote and kind of get your guys' opinions. So, you know, I think the title of this, this panel originally is about how there was, there was this, like, this hit piece that came out on, on ordinals from DAP Radar, which if you follow me on Twitter, you would have seen how I broke down like that their data was actually pretty, pretty wrong. They like compared, first of all, their data in May, which was the peak, was like over 2x uh, overestimated. And then they quoted data in August from the first half of the month and compared that to the full month of May, which is kind of crazy. Um, but we did see definitely some, like a, a speed run of the hype cycle for ordinals, right? And I think a lot of that was driven by, you know, some of the biggest centralized exchanges in the world coming in and adding a bunch of liquidity to ordinals to make that sort of May period that we were, we were in kind of like a mania. Um, and now we're back to what I think is more of a long-term sustainable path with ordinals. I'd love to get your guys' perspectives in terms of, you know, how do, do you guys feel like ordinals are dead? I mean, we've been seeing it. ordinals are dead everywhere. Are, are ordinals dead? And of, of all the things, that, and of all the things that we talked about, how do you see the demand coming in the future? 
Yeah, I think for us on the, on the panel here, it's, it's easy to forget. We did all this in a bear market. <laughs> like, you know, we did this in February until now, and, and uh, it was actually in the bear market. So it came out of nowhere. Um, the excitement came, I think, because it was Bitcoin, and everyone wanted to get involved and be early and get involved. So there was a huge spike uh, in February in the early, early part of the year. Um, now we're in kind of like a consolidation period, I would say, and people are really in the building mode and, and the excitement is starting to really ramp up because people are seeing it as a legitimate, you know, digital asset kind of class. Um, and I think that a lot more builders have got to come into the space. But yeah, I think um, ordinals are not dead. I think, you know, we're, we're just at the very, very beginning. Um, it's been one year uh, almost, and the amount of, um, you know, at, you know, new faces we've seen in Bitcoin, the amount of excitement we've seen around Bitcoin, builders, creatives, artists, developers coming back. Like, come on, you can't not say it's a good thing for Bitcoin. You know, the fact that the, 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 the excitement is there again. And, you know, it's, it's not perfect. Um, you know, we've st still got a lot of work to do. Raf's still got a lot of work to do. Uh, but I think, I think that, you know, we'll get there and, and the, the really th great thing I love about the Ordinals community is that we're not scared to just throw something and see what sticks to the wall and go out and just build stuff, um, opposed to potentially arguing about it for five years and not actually getting anything done. You know, I really like the Ordinals uh, community because it's just like, let's just go for it. You know, BRC20 was one of those examples that really skyrocketed. Love it or hate it, you know, it brought a lot of people into the space. Um, I'm just really excited to see what the future holds, um, to see if some maybe a larger institutions comes in. Maybe we can see some, some larger you know, enterprises from other chains coming in as well. Um, yeah, so let's see how we are this time next year in, in, in Bitcoin uh, conference. So. Yeah, I mean, look, look at this incredible audience we have here today too, guys. Like, give yourselves a round of applause because ordinals are not dead. I mean, you can look around yourselves. Ken. Yeah, I think ordinals are like way far from being dead. Um, if you if you look at any hype cycle, there's always that beginning where there's a lot of speculators driving up hype, you know, a lot of transactions, and then it settles down. But then there's always like long-term growth if the protocol itself is sustainable and it's a solid foundation. And from our perspective, we see that even in this deep bear market, uh, you know, after the initial craze, there's a lot of developers coming in now to build on ordinals. And maybe like as a consumer, if you just like trade ordinals, you don't see it. But there are a lot of things, interesting things being built for ordinals and Bitcoin. And I'm just super excited to see uh, all these things come out in the next six months to a year. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, let's go, guys. I'm super excited. All right, Danny. Yeah, so, so ordinals are very early. I mean, it's a new protocol. And actually, the sign of like a good protocol or a great protocol is that the design of the protocol is simple, yet it's very powerful. And that's what you have with Ornos. So the Ornos protocol, there's only two parts to it, and we talked about them in this panel. One is the ordinal number or just the ordinal numbering system, and the other is the inscription. So the inscription part was always started with, and we're talking about recursive inscriptions, right? The fact that we have an inscription, we can do a lot of programs on it. It's very powerful for developers. Developers are very excited by that. The, the, the first part about ordinal number, where we talk about the rare sat. Rare sat is an offshoot of this ordinal number idea, which actually was first uh, written about back by, or back in 11, 12 years ago by Charlie Lee. He, he wrote about ordinal numbers, and other people wrote about it too. Um, so it's an idea that's actually very, um, it's basically like a, a simple idea, but uh, hasn't been implemented yet until basically last year when Casey said, I'm going to do it. And so he did it, and now we have this great new protocol. And so it's very early. I, I think we're going to see great things on it in the coming years. Yeah, I think uh, great art always thrives around difficulty about like restrictions, be it, I don't know, cavemen mixing their first pigments to create their cave paintings or Renaissance sculptors working around the difficulty of working with uh, marble. And inscriptions and ordinals is very similar. Like you have to put all your data on chain. It's expensive. It's, it's difficult to work with, but I think this restriction is what kind of will create very much creativity. Um, just, and we're building out the tools, the recursive endpoints to kind of make it easier and, 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 and composable. But I think, yeah, this restriction is actually a, um, something positive that will, uh, yeah, make people more creative. 
And yeah, I'm really looking forward to see what people, getting more people into ordinals and inscriptions, seeing what they're going to build, developers, artists, it's all the same, it's all art. Um, and yeah, excited to see where the future goes. Awesome. So we have 90 seconds left, guys. So I want to go real quick, give the audience some final words. How can they learn more about ordinals? How can they get more involved in the community? And how can they follow you individually to learn more about yourselves? Yeah, OK, I think my closing remark is basically, um, if you love Bitcoin, you should love ordinals. Because what ordinals essentially does is it's like it's, it allows you to look at Bitcoin and consume Bitcoin through a little bit of a, a different lens. Um, it's a really amazingly beautiful representation of, of the core mechanics of Bitcoin, from Casey's mad idea to have a literal naming convention based on sats, that, and people are now looking at for, for, for those things and adding value to that. It's just a really nice representation of Bitcoin, and I think, uh, yeah, you should definitely research it and look into it. Um, and f from my side, you know, we are, Ordinals, at Ordinals Bot, we're really trying to, you know, make the you know, onboarding process for people really easy, building out developer tooling. Um, we've helped a lot with people launching collections there and things. So, yeah, please reach out to us on Twitter or Discord. And, uh, yeah, we're really excited to see what people are wanting to build there, and we'd love to help out. Awesome. Uh, so with, with Xverse, I think if you're interested in ordinals, definitely go get a wallet that supports ordinals to explore the entire ecosystem. Uh, but we also want to help developers. So we're releasing a bunch of developer-focused tooling that will help you build on top of ordinals. So if you're interested, go to xverse.app. I would join an, an ordinal community. I think that's where you can learn a lot about ordinals. And I can recommend one on Monkey. I have a couple of things to show. First of all, um, any developers who are seeing this, go to or uh, github.com ordinal slash ord. It's a code base written in Rust. It's very cool. Uh, we have issues. We mark them. Uh, good first issue. And I think you, there's some small stuff you can get into. And the second thing is uh, we're organizing a conference this Saturday here in Amsterdam. So if you want to learn more about inscribing, it's called Inscribing Amsterdam. I have the t-shirt on, so here. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, we still have a couple tickets left. Go to inscribingamsterdam.com if you want to learn more. It's going to be very art focused, but also like developer focused. There's going to be a mix of both technical and, and creative. And yeah, come by and uh, listen to us talk and create art. Awesome. awesome. And uh, one more thing, guys. If you're a builder in the audience, I am the managing partner of the Bitcoin Frontier Fund, and our application deadline for the next accelerator program is October 31st. I would love to write you a check if you are a builder who has something great that you're working on. Check out btcfrontier.fund. Apply to our accelerator. I would love to speak with you. Thank you guys so much for hosting an amazing panel. Give these guys a round of applause, everybody. Ordinals are not dead. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee, a city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.